for that other plane. We enter it simply by praise and worship. So let's offer a praise this morning. What is praise? Praise is talking about God. Saying God is good and God is merciful and He's kind. That's praise. Worship is talking to God. Getting personal, saying, God, I love you. God, thank you. That's talking directly with God. That's worship. Praise is just telling everybody, testifying about the good things that the Lord has done, is doing. So do all you can to praise and worship your way into His presence right now. Amen. Whatever you have to do, whatever you have to say, offer that up. The Bible says it turns into a sweet smelling savor unto God. And it moves God. It catches the attention of God. It stirs and touches the heart of God. Amen. And maybe for some it it helps him to remember the voice, amen, if we haven't been seeking or praying to him recently. And he says, hey, where have you been? Amen. Let's get into his presence right now. Lift your hands. That's all you got to do. Close your eyes. And just give your mind over to him and forget about the things that are happening and taking place in your life for just a few moments. <clears throat> Give that all to the Lord. The Bible says, or He said, cast all of your cares upon me. What are cares? Cares are your worries and your anxieties and your fears and your frustrations and your doubts and everything that this, this flesh kind of conjures up within us. All of that, he says, give it to me. Amen. Let's do that right now for a moment. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. God, have your way in this house this morning. See every mind. See every heart. See every situation. See every life. See every family. Every mom, every dad, every person here, God. They are all here by divine appointment. God, it is your appointment that you made with these individuals that are here this morning. Make your way to them. Walk among us. And we invite you to take your place in this house, in Jesus' name, I ask that you would teach, and I ask God that you would minister, and I ask that you would heal and save and deliver and move and stir and let your healing virtue and let your mighty wind to come blowing into this camp this morning, in Jesus' name. We surrender and we put away all these things that beset us, all the cares we put on you every load that we've been carrying, every things that, 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 that have mounted up in our lives. God, we give it to you. You said you give it to you, and we do so this morning. In Jesus' name, let us not leave here like we came in. Let us leave here rejoicing, full of joy and peace of mind and happiness and deliverance, power, all these things. It is here. It's available, God. And it's up to us whether we choose to pick it up or not. In Jesus' name, I ask that you rebuke any opposing spirit that may hinder this service this morning. Have your way. Your will be done. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. And greet your neighbor and honestly tell them with all your heart, I appreciate you, I love you, I 
Thank you. I, you have to hug and not do so. Amen. And let's show brotherly love and kindness to one another this morning. Amen. Greet a visitor. Let's be the called out ones that we are supposed to be. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Glad to be back this morning. It seems like I've been away for a long time. And now, treating, being good to my wife, amen. 28 years of our anniversary we celebrated the other day. And both of them blessed, blessing us. And I think I have him to owe and all these things to it. With my own flesh, I would have never done it. I would have wasn't able. I wasn't capable of doing it. My own flesh, my own way. And uh, I fall short. But with God, I'm able to accomplish many things. And that's one of them. Amen. Being a husband, being a father, being a leader, being a, a, a supporter. And I, I got a list of things that I, I got to live up to. And I'm thankful for God's strength and ability to have me do that. Our lesson title this morning is The Life That God Blesses. I said to the morning church, I don't think God blesses every kind of life. He only chooses those that seek, that hunger, that thirst, that desire, that put forth an effort, that show an effort, that, that want him, that come, that, that, that he sees faithfulness in, that he sees commitment and desire and uh, that endures, that keeps coming, that prays, that reads the word. I think that that's the kind of people that the Lord just un leashes his blessing and his love and his mercy and his power and all things. But don't get me wrong, the Lord still answers, the Lord still hears, and he's still faithful to his word. He's not going to refuse help to anyone. He's not going to close an ear to anyone. He's not going to close an eye to any one of our cries. Amen. If he can hear the person that was stuck in the pig pen, he can hear the person that is outside of the pig pen. It don't matter who you are, where you are, the Lord can still hear and save and deliver and change. But it's got to include your heart and your mind this morning. And our focus verse is taken out of Matthew chapter 5. I want to read the whole thing. It's just a blessing. I want to try to uh, hit all the points that our, our, our lesson talks about. The first one is the Beatitudes. This is the first teaching that the Lord that taught. He goes up on a hill. Amen. His first teaching, his first lesson is in uh, Matthew chapter 5. And it says, And seeing the multitudes, he went upon a mountain. And when he was seated, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit. What does it mean to be poor? To be poor means to have a little, to be lacking, or to have close to emptiness. Poor but what is poor in spirit? Poor in spirit could mean, thank you, brother, could mean uh, being hopeless, being uh, uh, brokenhearted. Poor in spirit could mean to be lost and to, 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 to live wearily and depressed and oppressed and maybe even blind and uh, downtrodden and pained and suffering and broken in spirit. That could be poor in spirit. The Bible says, or Jesus said, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That is your ticket to enter in His presence. What an opportunity, amen, to be, to be poor in spirit, to be broken and weary and cast aside and struggling and pain and suffering all the time. You, your kingdom is heaven, Jesus said. And then he says, blessed are those who mourn. Maybe some of you are mourning this morning. What, is, uh, what does it mean to be, to, to mourn? 
could possibly mean to carry grief, to carry uh, regret, maybe sorrowful and sad and down and gloomy and oppressed. That's to mourn all the time, to, to just be overcome with grief and pain and maybe for our sins and maybe for our past, whatever it may be that we're, that we're carrying, we mourn. The Bible, Jesus says, for they shall be comforted. Amen. And then he goes on to say, blessed are the meek. What is a meek person? A meek person is one who is patient. A meek person is one who is kind. A meek person is one who is gentle and quiet. Doesn't talk back. Doesn't, uh, doesn't um, complain. Doesn't um, keep record of wrong. Doesn't talk back. Doesn't anger. Doesn't, uh, is not strifeful. It, it doesn't create enemies or have enemies. He's just quiet and gentle and calm and patient and just has his head down and just focused on one thing and not let anything in the world trouble him. That's meekness. But Jesus says, the meek, they shall inherit the earth. Jesus went on to say in verse 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are those that desire and thirst and strive and walk after and pursue righteousness, uprightness, goodness. Blessed are those who nothing else in this world matters to them. Nothing else in this world troubles them. Nothing in this world derails them or sidetracks them. Nothing in this world affects them or offends them. Only to desire God. Only to follow God. Only to seek after Him. Only to please God. Only to obey His Word. Blessed are those that hunger and thirst after righteousness. They crave it. They want more of it. They felt the goodness of God when they've done righteous. they lived righteously. And God blesses them with this inner peace, this inner, this, this calmness, this serenity, this joy, this peace that can only come from God. That, that they begin to notice that. They begin to feel it. They begin to crave. They want more of it. They want more of it. That's what the Bible is talking about. Blessed are those that hunger and thirst for more of it. Knowing that they've lived right, done right, said right, did everything in their power to be obedient, to live right. They desire it more like food to avoid, to keep them from dying. That's what you do when you're hungry and thirsty enough, right? You do anything you can to get food in you, to nourish yourself. You, you go do anything to get a drink of water, to get a uh, to, to, to get your next meal. It's, you don't want to die. That's the way we hunger and thirst when we desire more. We want our spiritual man to be fed. We want our spiritual spiritual man to be nourished and to feel that presence and that power and that joy that only comes from God. And look what Jesus said after them. Those kind will be filled. Your efforts are not going to go unnoticed. You desire, you hunger and thirst. Jesus said, I will fill you. Not maybe. He says, they shall be filled. How many of you hunger and thirst after him, even today, even now, this week, these past months and years, months we've been praying how I many of you have been hungering and thirsting on behalf of your family, for your kids, for your spouse, for your marriage, for your job, for your home, for your future, for your deliverance, for your salvation? How many of you actually hunger and thirst to be, to be used and to be touched by 
God, how many of you desire that it come into your heart and overwhelm you that, that this kingdom of God that we talked about? How many of you desire that it just be poured out on you? You live this life that's just half empty. You live this life that's just like, what am I doing? I'm concerned about all, all the wrong things. I'm thankful when we come to that place in our life where we look around and say, what am I doing? This is nothing. That's nothing. What's that going to give me? What's that going to offer me? What am I doing? i got to get my priorities straight in line, in order. That should be happening in this time, in this hour. If you're not feeling it, Because I believe in the end when the Lord is almost coming back, when the time is near, He's going to start speaking to people. He's going to start having people remember. Remember the Bible says, teach them. And when they get old, they will not depart from it. You remember all the old teachings. You remember when you went to Sunday school. You, all these teachings, all this, this stuff that you heard, the different ministers and churches that you've been to, you, it becomes flooding back. That's the Lord tugging at your heart, telling you, hey, my coming is soon. My return is soon. Get ready. I don't want you to be getting ready. I want you to be ready. I pray that the Lord fill every one of us this morning with more power, with more faith, with more hope, with more fire, with more fervency, with more love. Verse 7, Jesus said, Blessed are the merciful. Are you merciful this morning? Are you compassionate? this morning? Are you gracious this morning? Are you able and easily to forgive your brothers and others that say things and do things against you, your family, your, anything about you? Are you merciful? Jesus said, if those are, that are merciful, they shall obtain mercy. And Jesus continued teaching and said, Blessed are the pure in heart. To be pure in heart means to live righteously. To be upright in every area of our lives. To live and say and do and work the best that we're able to. We fall short, yes. We're still human. We still think things. We still say things. We still, we're still human. But at the end of the day, to say, Lord, forgive me. Help me. Change me. Clean me. I want to become better. I want to become right. Help me to change my way of thinking, my words, my thought. My, help me to change. You repeat that process every day. That's how your heart changes. The issues of life come out of your heart. Examine your heart right now. Where is your heart? What is, what's your heart consumed of? What, what does your heart say? What does it lead you? How does it govern you? What kind of words and actions does it cause you to do and think? Jesus said the pure in heart are blessed when, when they're upright, when their heart is clean, when they're honest. When you see their life and their life is just nothing but a, a good report. They're trying, they're doing everything they can and they're part, they may not be perfect, but they, they're faithful. They keep coming. They keep praying. They keep coming to church. They keep going to Sunday school. They keep coming to the altar. They keep seeking you. They keep desiring you. That's how our heart changes. We got to meet God halfway. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. Are you a peacemaker? Or are you a troublemaker? Do you support trouble? Or do you oppose it? Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. What is a peacemaker? A peacemaker is not one that quarrels. 
is not one that argues. A peacemaker is not one that fights, that remembers wrong done, did, or said, does not keep record of track of wrongdoing. Brother did this to me 30 years ago, and I still haven't forgiven. I've heard people say that. 30 years ago, wow. But blessed are the peacemakers that put all that behind them and put it under the blood and change the ways that are not angry or bitter, that are argumentative, that are, that are just good people. Jesus said, they, the peacemakers, look at this one, I love this one. The peacemakers shall be called the sons of God. I want to be a son of God. Are you a son of God Almighty? Can you admit the fact that, hey, I am, do you, something inside you know and is confident to say, to be bold enough to say, I'm a son of God. I'm a daughter of God. He knows my heart, and I know I'm in the family. I know I'm a part of that family. I know I'm plugged in. I know I'm involved. I know God knows, and I know God sees me and hears me because I see Him working in my life all around me. My home is blessed. My job is blessed. My life is blessed. I'm blessed with health and my kids are good and all these things. I can see evidence of His hand in my life and in my situation. I want to be a son of God and know for sure and be confident to say, I'm a child of God. I'm a true set aside heir of Jesus, of God. If you're not sure, if you're not confident, I take the advantage now while there's still grace and mercy on this earth to get to that point. Because grace and mercy is not always going to be here. One of these seconds in the blink of an eye, it's going to disappear. Church is going to disappear. Pastors, leaders, preachers, it's going to disappear. It's going to be caught up. Now's your only chance while you're here. Divine appointment I mentioned this morning. Take advantage of it. This is the church we invite you to do so. If you haven't, come and hear the word and change and heal and deliver. God is still in the saving business this morning. He hasn't changed from thousands and thousands of years ago. He still looks over the land and begins to weep because he sees the souls of men and how they're troubled and how he desires that his children would just Come back to Him. I want to be a son of God this morning. Jesus continues to teach and says, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. A sister said this morning that I don't think we're persecuted in this day like we were back then. I think it's triple-fold, if not tenfold, the way we are persecuted. How? What do I mean by that? We're harassed every second of every day by the enemy. We're tempted on every side the minute we step out the door. We're tempted in our mind. We're tempted by our past. We're tempted by our friends. We're tempted by things of this world and all the glamour, the, the lights or whatever, the alcohol, the drugs, the friends, the, the habits. The enemy reminds us. He harasses us. We're persecuted because we're oppressed. Oppressed means that we have an army working against us. 
I don't think we have just one devil maybe appointed to. I think we have a number of devils that lie to us, try to deceive us, try to lie to us, try to tempt us, try to, to knock us up, try to knock us down, try to pull us out of the church, try to put words and plant things in our lives and cause disruption to, to be bitter and angry and all this stuff. All the day long we are persecuted. Maybe not physically, but spiritually. We are persecuted. Another way we're persecuted is we're tested every day. We're tried every day. We're in the fire every day. Tribulations every day. We step into it. How do we react to it? Do we fail? Do we, how do we respond to all that? persecution. We can't make it by ourselves with our own strength, with our own mind. Nothing is human. Humanity has to offer is able to overcome persecution from an enemy that has two, over 2,000 years of experience. How are, we able, or how are we able to overcome an enemy that has 2,000 plus years of experience? More than that, he has an army. We don't fight against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against rulers, against powers and rulers of the darkness of the air, spiritual wickedness in high places. That's high, powerful, structured, organized army. That is after your soul, your child's souls, your family, your spouse, every soul that you love is on the attack. So I can't say that we're not persecuted like we were. We are more than persecuted in these last days. We've got more opposition We've got more things that trouble us and more things that try us and test us. But Jesus said, Blessed are those who, who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. If you live through all this and you do your best to stand and to walk and to endure, and even though you may trip and fall down and you pick yourself up, you dust yourself off. You start walking again even though you're harassed and oppressed and tested and tried and lied about and deceived and tempted and persecuted. You do your best. And Jesus said, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You'll have a revelation of what your purpose is. You'll see God's God will reveal something into your heart and in your mind that will cause you to commit. God, I've been there. I've seen that. I've done that. I know how it feels. Now, something's going to change. And only God can do that. Jesus said, blessed are you when they revile. What does it mean? Blessed when you are reviled. To be reviled means to To be criticized, to be spoken of with abuse, talked down on, belittled, cursed, cussed out. You're no good, you're like this, you're just an alcoholic, you're no good, you're a drug addict, you did all these mistakes, you're, you're, you're no good father, you're no good mother, you've done this, you said that, you're abusive language, hurtful language criticizing words, spiritual abuse, physical abuse, mental abuse, and blame and scorn, getting the blame for everything, getting scorned. Blessed when those things happen to you, when you're being reviled and persecuted, and when, when they say all kinds of evil, what kind of evil things could be said about us? Lies are evil. Rumors are evil. Gossip is evil. These things will damage you and 
corrupt you and, and ruin you, any kind of evil, then Jesus says, blessed are you when they revile and persecute, say evil things about you and against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice, it says in the end. All this in the middle of it, rejoice. Say thank you. <laughs> thank you. Rejoice and be glad. Who can be glad when somebody's beating you down and cursing you and kicking you around and dragging you through the dirt and laughing at you and scorning you? Who can be glad? Jesus said, I overcame those things. I've already endured those things for you. They hurt me first. They laughed at me first. They, they pulled my hair out, but they crucified me. They rejected me first. I conquered all those things so that it will be easier for you. All you have to do is endure because I got you. I got your back. I conquered it. I prevailed over it. So when it's your turn, just know that there's a way out. Just know there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Just know that you're going to overcome and that you're going to conquer. Just know that you're going to come out better on the other side. Just know that you're going to come out as gold on the other side. Because I first suffered those things. Be glad that... You know that you're going to become better than you were before you went into this. Be glad and exceedingly grateful and rejoice knowing that because of your suffering, look what Jesus said in verse 12. Great is your reward in heaven. I imagine the soldier with all these medals of honor and overcoming this and this and this and that. Imagine how many medals of honor that you've accumulated so far. Imagine all the wars and the battles that you've endured and all the medals that you've accumulated when you've, get, when you've gotten to heaven. That crown when it's placed on you and all the stones and, that you've acquired. Great is your reward, our reward when we get to heaven. We're going to finally then say it was worth it. I'm glad I suffered. I'm glad I was broken. I'm glad I had to go through hell. Because I'm here now with my family and my kids. Jesus said, Rejoice, be glad. Because... For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Amen. I think hey, after reading this, I believe this is where that question came from where people say, why do bad things happen to good people? I believe it's kind of, this is where it started. Those, it seems like we look around and we see those, that, those people that live in sin seem to live happier lives and full lives and blessed lives. And you look over the fence and they're just having a party and a heyday and they're being blessed left to right. And here we are, we're, we're poor. Not only in spirit, we're actually poor. We look over and we just see all the fancy cars and the I think that's where it comes from. We look over and we see sin being blessed. I shouldn't say blessed. Sin thriving. And here we are as saints. We seem to struggle. We, we try. Our work is hard, our journey is up the hill, and, and uh, things are harder for us, and we have more difficulty navigating through this life. 
Remember the Bible when it says wide and broad is the path that leads to death and destruction. That path is easy. Anybody can do. You don't even have to try going down that wide path. That path is easy. That path is fun. That path is glamorous. That path seems like the right way, the good way, the fun way to go. It's not even difficult to walk. You just have to, you can just slide down that path of sinful living. But the path, the Bible mentions, the path that is narrow, that path is a little more difficult. And the Bible says there are few people that find it and actually choose to walk down that path. Few that choose to walk down the narrow but That path is difficult. Not only is it difficult because we need to be extra careful that we don't fall or slip. It's, it's even more difficult, difficult because the whole time we have to carry a cross with us. And that path is not only narrow, it's not only troublesome because we have a cross on our back. That path is like a dark valley. David said, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I am not going to fear any evil, no evil. Although I choose to walk down this road, I'm not going to fret. I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to turn around. I'm not going to be afraid. I'm going to persist. I'm going to pursue. I'm going to make it. Because the Bible says this path leads to life everlasting. It's going to be worth it. Church, when we arrive in heaven with our family, our kids, our spouse, our family, cousins, it's going to be worth it to have lived a life of trial and trouble and persecution. It's going to all have been worth it. The Bible says, count it all joy when you fall into different trials because these tests produce more faith, it produces more patience, and it performs the perfect work within you. It perfects you, everything inside and out. When you just stand in there and let the Lord shape and mold you and change you and do all, make you what He wants you to become. All of you have talents and ability and skill that you could work, that you could use and work in His kingdom. Do you know that? Let Him shape you. Let Him design you. Let Him mold you. Let Him, let him establish you in His kingdom. The only way you can do that is if you continue to sit right there every Sunday, every Wednesday, you're faithful. Let God have His way. The Bible says He'll leave you perfect and complete and lacking nothing. What a promise. Who else can say that to you? Who else can bless you like that? Who else can change you like that? Nobody but God. I better move on. Let's move on to the next one in our lesson text. Galatians chapter 5. This is the opposite. It says, The works of the flesh are evident, which is adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfishness, dissensions, heresies, envies, murderers, drunkenness, revelries, 
animal like of which I tell you before, just as I also told you in times past, that those who practice these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. I hope that you're not one of those things. If you are, repent, change your ways. And I desire that you pray what the Bible says in the next verse, 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And if we are to live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Ooh, what a lesson. Hey, man, I haven't even got to our lesson. Boy, let me just read the truth about God. The truth about God says, God desires. Do you hear that? God desires to pour out His blessings on those who recognize their need of Him. You have to express some kind of need and want. God seeks that. God desires that. The truth for my life says I, from my point, I will acknowledge my need for God. Where are you at this morning? Do you desire, do you truly seek and thirst and desire and hunger and just want more of His presence, His power, His wisdom, His knowledge, His way in your life? Do you want it to truly dominate every part of your life? That's what God desires if somebody would just step up and take His place to be like Him, to be His true Son, to carry on what He came to do, to love like He loved, to reach out like He reached out, to pray with those, to sit down with those that He reached out and loved. He wants to, us to continue to go to the byways and to sit with the sinners, and that's what He did. God desires that there be Somebody that would carry on the same work and love humanity as he loved humanity. I know this morning that God desires that there be anybody that would have the same mind as he did. God desires also, I believe, that people would see, if they would just see themselves and examine themselves and recognize the fact that they are nothing without Him. We think we're all this because we have that, we have that job, we're like this, and we think we're making our own way. And, but everything comes from the Lord. This body came from the Lord. Our words, our, our mind, our spirit, our living, our heart beats because of Him. Our mind thinks because of Him. That's where we've got our knowledge, our understanding, our everything comes from God. Who are we to think we're anybody or anything? We can't even wake ourselves up in the morning. We can't even continue to let this body live. We're unable. Everything comes from the Lord. God desires just His people to just commit and dedicate themselves to this way of life, this Christian living, this set aside separation, holiness living. We're only pilgrims passing through this world. This isn't our destination. This is all. We're just passing through this life. Our real life begins when we get to the other side. Amen. God desires nothing more than to bless His children. Bless them with what? With power? With love? 
Bible says, I give you power, love, and a sound mind. A sound mind thinks good and clear and focused. And he wants to bless us with faith and hope and peace and joy and all these things. But the problem is when we start to help God, instead of Him being the doctor and our physician and our caretaker, we become our own doctor. We become our own physician. We become our, our own caretaker. Instead of Him, letting Him be our guide and our counselor, we seek our own counsel and we're guided by our own flesh and we're guided by this world and we're guard, guided by carnality. Instead of Him being the way maker, we end up making our own way. Our will, my will, my plan, my way, my path, what I choose, what I think. That's not how this is designed. We're supposed to trust God. We're supposed to follow God and ask of Him and just, uh, are you understanding me this morning? God desires that His people will be meek and humble and quiet and peaceful and have faith and then be able to endure and just walk and be peaceful and kind and loving and patient all the while while being persecuted, reviled, rejected, talked about and persecuted. Is that easy to do as humans? That's impossible to do, right, as humans. The minute we hear something negative, something wrong, what, what something says about us, any issue that comes up in our life, wow, what happens to us? We fall apart, we get confused, we get lost, we get angry, we get bitter, we put up the shield and we fight back. We get angry, we get puffed up, we get uh, rude, we, we start saying things back, we start fighting back and we retaliate. We say things. The world today has become a hostile people. Remember what Matthew chapter 24 and verse 57 says, or uh, not 57, 37. He says, just like it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming days of the Son of Man. Can you honestly say this morning, church, that becoming a Christian is getting easier and easier? I don't think so. Would you agree with me? That battle for your soul is getting more and more fierce and severe minute by minute. All the devil wants is to ruin, to maim, to destroy, and kill you. Maybe not physically, but your spirituality. Something about you he's after that he don't want you to have. The Bible says even the very elect are going to be deceived. And I think the only thing, the only chance we have is if we learn one attribute. And I leave with you this morning this one attribute. I believe if we just learn this one thing, it covers everything. If we learn this one little attribute, take out your pen and paper. I want, to write, I want you to write down this word. This is no secret. This is no new thing. This one attribute will change the way we think. It'll change the way we act. It'll change the way we live. It'll cover every struggle. It'll, it'll dissipate every struggle, every sin, all of Satan's works, all of his fiery darts, all of it. 
will just melt away if we learn this one attribute. Are you ready for it? L O V E. Love. If we could just learn to love God and His Word and all the things that pertain to His kingdom, I know and I believe everything else is going to fall in order. Everything else will become unimportant. Our troubles, worries, pain, all this stuff that I talked about earlier is going to seem just so small and insignificant. When we have the true love of God in us, in our minds, all that other junk and muck is going to become unimportant and nothing to us. If we could just learn to love like He loved, if we could just learn to allow and let love occupy our mind and fill our minds and just, just, because love would want to please God. Love would want to obey God. Love would want to do good and do right and hunger and thirst. Love knows exactly what to do. Love says, lo the Bible says, and I don't remember where it said, but believe me, trust me, it says that love covers a multitude of sins. What a scripture. Love covers a multitude. If we have love, we won't struggle with the works of the flesh. All that stuff that I mentioned, jealousy, contentions, uh, of opposition, arguments, and dislike, hostility, uh, idols and magic, unclean thoughts, dirty mouths, dirty words, and immorality, and uh, it'll just make all that go away. So pray for love this month. Amen? And that is what we're going to pray for this month. Pray when you come to the house. God, fill me with love. Let me learn love. Let me talk and live and move and do everything in love and see what happens. You learn to love the way God is. Say, God, give me your love. I want to think the way you do. Walk and talk and act and work and live like you did. Amen. Praise the Lord. Be blessed this morning and don't forget what you heard this morning. God blesses the life that is hungry, desires, and thirsts, and seeks after Him. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Some very encouraging stuff.